learning environments, both physically and also that mindset, the technologies and the, the strategies you use to help students learn. And so I'm really excited to um, have this conference here again this year. We've got over 77 different concurrent sessions where you'll get to hear from your colleagues all kinds of different things that they're doing. We have over 200 attendees registered, so it worked out actually pretty well that we we're at Westminster this year while Boulder's being remodeled. So thank you to the Westminster leadership for welcoming us here and being able to host it here this year. Just a quick reminder, you all have your badges. Be sure to wear those and bring them back tomorrow um, so that you can scan them when you go into every session. Thanks to college leadership, um, we are able to pay for up to the first five hours of attendance for the first hundred people who registered. So I think that's, uh, that really says a lot about the investment that Front Range makes in professional development and growing our environment. Lunch will be served out there at the rotunda and um, be sure to cycle, recycle your name badges. So just to, to prime you um, as you're going through these days, um, think about, you know, what are you doing to grow your own learning environment? So not only for your students, but to keep yourself alive and fresh and growing. Um, and we have, when you go downstairs by where the concurrent sessions are, there are some post-its that are in little leaf shapes. And so I'll take one of those, or two or three or more, and just break down what is an aha moment that you have, or what's an exciting project that you're working on. Um, something that you want to implement in the coming year, or an idea for a presentation you'd like to have in the coming year. You might think of those as, each of those will form little leaves that then will attach. So bring them up here um, during the all-conference sessions, or the rest of the time they'll be downstairs. You'll see them as you're going to the concurrent sessions. You can just attach those little post-it notes with a little twisty to these trees, and we'll grow our trees over the course of this conference, and then we'll harvest all those leaves and select from those winners so that um, you know, as we do every year we have a, a few books that you can choose your own books so it's about something that you want to learn about teaching and learning with technology so we'll use all those um, be sure to write your name we'll um, use those to select three winners to choose a book and we'll send that out after the conference along with the feedback surveys that you can tell us what you liked about this year and what you'd like to see next year So I'd like to take the opportunity to um, highlight a, just a couple of the leaves that we have going on here in the college. Um, we were fortunate this year that the e-learning consortium of Colorado recognized um, both a team at Front Range as well as an individual at Front Range for some of their annual awards. And the first one I wanted to highlight for all of you is the Learning Technologies Team Award. Um, much. So is anyone who worked on that, the, the team members are Anjali Vaidya, Marcus Fowler, Kay Novak, Pam Fisher, Jeff Wall, and Helga Heiser. Any of you who are in the room, if you could stand up. I know some of them were working the conference, so they might be at some of the other sessions. So if you run into them, <laughs> collaborative effort um, where they created an ancient Egypt microbiology murder mystery as an information and technology literacy project. And this murder mystery is an epistemic game that pairs up two classes, so humanities class or humanities classes and microbiology classes through synchronous technology to solve the mysterious illness that struck down Egyptologist Professor Bath. Microbiology students attended an ancient Egypt exhibit and lecture at the Westminster campus College Hill Library. The guest lecturer is suddenly struck ill and the students had to go through the process of solving what happened. While the microbiology students investigated, they found that they needed help understanding the ancient Egypt mythology clues. A humanities class at the Boulder Community College campus was contacted through Skype to serve as researchers and help the microbiology students solve the mystery. Students in both classes search for information and analyze the symptoms and the historical references. Microbiology students analyze the infectious disease symptoms, while humanity students sort through legends, conspiracy theories, and records until they find accurate source here. 
At the end of the learning experience, all students learn more about their content area and how to find reliable sources. This is a technology-intensive exercise with students using personal mobile devices, which you'll have a chance to do some things with personal mobile devices yourselves tomorrow. Personal laptops, as well as campus computers, internet searches, and library databases. So you've probably heard this one over the years. This project has been evolving, and I think is a great example of continuous improvement and also collaboration between different campuses, different people, um, to really create an engaging experience for our students. And then I also want to congratulate, and she's unfortunately not able to be here right now, so I will give her, I have an award for her that I will hopefully be able to give to her ceremony tomorrow, so you can keep that, keep that piece of secret and we'll um, give her that award tomorrow. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge Diana Montalegre. <laughs> so she is both e-learning, the e-learning consortium's online advocate of the year, um, but also I'm awarding her the special dean's recognition for this year for all the work she's done in terms of universal design. She's, I see nod, heads nodding around the room. because she, she just chips in and does everything. She builds courses. She works with subject matter experts outside of the college to build courses. And then really the last two years, she has taken on teaching herself. So she's one of the experts really in digital accessibility here at the college and even within higher ed in Colorado. Um, and we wanted to take this year to recognize her because CU has scooped her up and so she'll be <laughs> just, just over the hill, um, but continuing to help us in Colorado. And she'll leave, she leaves many things behind for us to continue to learn ourselves. She develops lots of self-paced resources, um, lots of training and workshops. Hopefully you can experience some of them at the conference this year. And we just really couldn't be more grateful to Deanna. She's a great inspiration. You might think of each of us as, we all have lots of leaves, we're constantly sprouting new ideas. So each individual you might think of as a tree, or maybe your department, or your, your group of colleagues that's working on something. Think of the impact when we have, when we have a whole room like this. And just for fun, because I was thinking about this when I came in the room, you all stand up. <laughs> Here. And continue to do that throughout the throughout the conference a little bit. This is really it's truly amazing. And one leaf, you know, I have I have aspen leaves in my backyard and you can hear the leaves and it's kind of whispering. Think about going on a hike through the forest and the rush of the aspen leaves staying here. So we're all about impact, right? Our pathways work is about taking those small things that we're doing in little pockets figure out how to tie them together, and so we have more impact on students and student success. So I'll leave you with this image. Just think of all the impact that we have when we're all working together, and as our projects kind of grow and mature, it's really amazing. So welcome to the conference. Lots of opportunities. Please go ahead and sit down. Um, lots of opportunities to collaborate and continue to, to grow our learning environment. So next up, I would like to introduce Roxanne Strand. Many of you know her. Um, in this context, she, she wears many hats, as you know. So she said, in this context, I'm the Learning Technology Service Manager. And she is leading a new group, pretty new, this last year, that is the Student and Classroom Technology Standards Project Team. And they've been really working really hard to collaborate college-wide, figuring out how can we improve our technology environment for students in our classrooms and at our school. And so I'd like to welcome her up here, and then she'll introduce some very special guests that we have here today for our keynote.
Thank you, Tammy, and hi, everyone. Yes, I um, do wear many hats. I work in the IT department, and um, I began a new, I took on a new role as the Learning Technology Service Manager. Um, and as the Learning Tech Service Manager, I invested in enhancing teaching and technology, teaching and learning using technology. To that end, I was named the project manager for the Student and Classroom Technology Standards Project. Beginning a discussion about a project by showing the project team before talking about the purpose or deliverable <coughs> might seem a little bit backwards. However, proper representation is critical to the success of this project. So my hope is that while you're looking through these names, you'll notice the diversity of the group. The team is well-rounded with faculty, instructors, and staff. <clears throat> this slide shows just half of our team. I'll share the next slide after I give you a minute just to read through the names and their role at Front Range. And to the project team, uh, if you're in the audience today, will you stand for just a moment?
campuses. I spent seven years at the University of Rhode Island, where I served as dean of the University of Libraries, the chief information officer, and the FDC and uh, helped uh, make some pretty big changes to URI in terms of the infrastructure and the teaching. We made the transition from WebCT to Blackboard while I was there, implemented a number of enterprise systems such as PeopleSoft, the administrative side of the institution. And then I was recruited to go to the University of San Diego. Uh, they were basically going through a massive transformation of the new president and new provost. And I was recruited to go in as the vice provost and CIO for USD uh, in 2006. I so started 13 years. And had a wonderful run and a great time transforming that institution. Um, well, just so you know, that, that we were super centralized at USG with academic technology, all the administrative systems, AV, classroom support, and many other, um, many other units, to IT related units. Try this, oh, okay. Is this on? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Should I start over? <laughs> well, thanks for uh, uh, letting me know. I would have gone for hours talking. <laughs> and um, anyways, uh, it was a great run at USD. And we, su we super centralized IT, so everything came in. Research, computing, emerging technologies, all sorts of things in one place. And it, it worked out really well. But then I was recruited away to what I think is one of the most special jobs in my education, and that's working at Dell. Dell Technologies is an extremely special place. People don't know this, but there's a huge portfolio of technologies at the company. And I get to go to campuses like this and work with faculty all over the country. Um, can't hear me? OK. Um, so uh, what I have is a quick keynote address. I want to step through those uh, slides pretty quickly here. And let me just see if this one's I don't know. Close approximately. So, um, uh, this is the topic of the keynote. 
I'm going to cover these things very quickly so that we have an opportunity to cover. And Lita is here. By the way, Lita is your account executive from the old technology. Say hi to him. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I want to put this up. Um, one of the, the fundamental purpose and this comes straight from my own development the executives of the company. We believe this. Yes. I think you'll need to put the microphone on your chin. Do <laughs> it here. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. That's better, isn't it? Anyways, the purpose is to create technologies that drive human progress, and that is truly one of the things that Dell uh, does extremely well. In addition, um, well, this is the fundamental research around workforce transformation in the 2030 initiatives. Uh, there, these are all of this is cited at the Dell Technologies website. In case you want to dive, take a deeper dive into it. Basically, Dell uh, partnered with the Institute for the Futures. They chose 20 futurists that are around the world that really know and think about these things on a daily basis. Uh, got them together to think about the future technologies such as AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, and how it will reshape the way we're living in 2030. Um, in addition, those futurists helped design a survey that went out to business executives around the world. So these are major corporations throughout the world, and there were 3,800 responses to the survey. Um, as you can see, there's some pretty incredible numbers here. The Internet of Things and all the devices and sensors that are going, coming onto the Internet are um, growing exponentially, and they forecast that 125 billion devices will be connected to the Internet, uh, which is a little daunting, uh, securing all those devices and so forth. 50% of the cars will be driverless. Uh, we anticipate uh, based on this research that a lot of the driverless cars, the first ones will actually be delivery vehicles and trucks. I know in Scandinavia, Volvo has a major project going on with large um, autonomous delivery trucks right now. Uh, Singapore is doing some similar experiments. Uh, the, third, the third item on there to me is incredible. My dad is a cellular biologist. He still talk, he's 87 and he still talks about biology all the time. His mind is still sharp. And, you know, the fact is, I don't think the Human Genome Pro Project actually run, ran for about 14 years and thousands of scientists from around the world were involved. And so that is a stunning statistic that we can actually, with compute power at the rate it's going, we'll be able to decode the entire, entire human genome in 94 seconds in 2030. And then artificial intelligence is certainly going to improve. So really, the way we work, the way we learn, is just changing at a dramatic pace. Um, Gordon Moore's similar piece and paper in 1965, when he was CEO, it was either Fairchild Semiconductor or Intel, I can't remember which. Uh, it, it was projecting a doubling of technology every year based on the number of circuits you could build onto a board or transi transistors. And in fact, I think that is actually being blown away if these, if these forecasts come to be accurate based on the future study. Change is accelerating in the next minute. Here's some of the results from that survey uh, conducted by the Institute for the Future. I think this is super important to understand that the skills that are going to be important in the future are things we already think about today. Critical thinking skills, your ability to use logic, uh, emotional intelligence is very important in terms of how people interact in the workplace. Uh, the ability to uh, be technologically literate and adapt quickly to situations, project management, using judgment and complex decision making. Um, 
This is more recent data. It was done in 2016 through a Forbes survey, and it's, some, it's consistent with what we were finding in those forecasted uh, skill sets uh, out of the 2037, 2030 uh, futures. Study. Being self-guided, thinking independently, also working as a team member is important. Being proactive, goal-oriented. And they, these are results from the survey as well of what jobs might exist in 2030. The forecast of the futurists suggests that about 85% of jobs are not yet defined for 2030. Uh, in particular, you can imagine things like uh, human technology and machine learning, uh, how, that, how an interface occurs between humans and machines. Certainly implants are going to be a factor. How, how those are maintained and uh, monitored are going to be critical. Security around all these mobile devices and IoT and edge computing is going to be important. Self-driving car mechanic. It's not going to be your average guy down at Pep Boys today. You know, that, all that whole world is going to change. And um, the skills are going to change too. Contextual intelligence automation literacy uh, are critically important. But the most uh, remarkable thing that, I, that was concluded in the study I found is that bottom line there. That is the ability to gain new knowledge is going to be extremely important for people. Um, how we work, uh, where we work, all of that's going to change as well. 60% of people will be working after hours. Um, I think proximity, that is being in a certain workplace, is going to change. You're, you're, the world is at the point where remote access to work is going to be more and more important. Working from home, uh, people will need jobs if the technology is not there. Uh, and certainly, we're seeing in the millennials and Gen Z folks that Having great technology will help them to determine who, who to work for. You can see that stat, 44% of millennials think workspace isn't smart enough right now. Um, these are some student expectations from data at Dell, as well as through Educause in our 2017 student survey. Um, I think what's, what's odd is that, well, you'll see that the change in preferences around Blended learning environments has been has, has changed somewhat, um, but 79% of the students prefer face-to-face -face combined with online. So hybrid courses is the preference rather than just face-to-face -face or fully online. Um, again, 82% state that technology influences influence their choice of employer. Dell also completed a, a global uh, survey of Gen Z. And I wanted to share these results. So over 12,000 Gen Z students uh, completed the survey in 17 countries. And in fact, um, the Generation Z group has an even deeper understanding and appreciation for technology as well as expectations. So 80% aspire to work with cutting edge technology. 91% say technology would influence the job of choice and 80% believe technology and automation will create a more equitable work environment. Uh, that URL on the bottom of the screen it is a summary of all of the data around and, and uh, executive summary of the research around Gen Z, in case you want to access that. So, you know, the, what this says to me is there's a link between the workplace and what's going to be expected in the next decade or more in higher education. And I firmly believe higher education has a huge role to play in helping students be successful for their careers. That's why I work, I've spent my career in higher ed. I believe universities and colleges have an instrumental role. But it also means We've got to bring in new technologies, and these are just some of them that I'll talk about, but the emerging technologies around AI and uh, VR is critically important. How uh, IoT is rolled out, engineering schools are certainly going to need to focus on that. 
and doing it in an intelligent way and in a secure way uh, that doesn't violate people's privacy. Um, in particular, I was uh, a month ago, six weeks ago, I was at the UCLA Medical School and spent a considerable amount of time with their dean and faculty members and they are going to be pushing VR in medical school for certainly the first year students and courses to have a better understanding of the human body. So there's a product called Blousen VR that is uh, going to be used there and experimented with. It's the largest um, medical image database in the world that has been converted into a VR scenario. And it's truly incredible when you put the glasses on, you can actually control the body and the organ and watch what happens with blood flow or what the heart is doing and then you can simulate problems. And it, this, is, this is an incredible advancement for medical schools because you don't need cadavers anymore. And you can accelerate the learning process. Um, down below here on the bottom of this slide is the Adamage table that um, was developed with Stanford University and it's basically a giant touch screen where you can uh, look at the human body in many, many different ways. Another example is um, how VR and other emerging, and I, and I don't want to be married to the idea that VR is the solution. The fact of the matter is, what I'm get, the point I'm getting at here is that with active learning and certain types of technology, you can move down the pyramid to get to where we want to be, and that is learn by doing. And you know as faculty members in the room that learning by teaching is certainly the premier uh, way to learn things. Uh, passive learning is at the top of the period. The faculty member that simply lectures to the class is living up there in the retention zone that I think we should avoid. Educause has just completed their 2018 survey. It usually takes a year before they actually summarize all the results. This is act, 64,000 students were involved in the survey, over 130 institutions in nine countries, 36 states. Uh, the reason I wanted to bring this, this up is because community colleges are actually shining as a bright light in this uh, survey ahead of the doctoral institutions in many ways. One other unique characteristic of the survey this year at Educause is they tried to categorize students into these categories based on the amount of time they're spending online as well as what are they doing online. So the typical student is the typical student there. You know, it looks like four to one hours of research they're not gamers. They're sort of mid-level social media gurus spending one to two hours online. And, um, and you can see the differences in the, in the various types of classifications with the studious student being doing online homework and research over five hours. What's so interesting is the split and the way these students are categorizing themselves we're seeing one of the biggest growth areas in higher education for technology actually being gaming and esports. I don't know if Front Range has an esports club or a team yet, but I would guess within the next few years it's going to come up that it hasn't already. And it's incredible the amount of time and effort these uh, gaming athletes put in. But it, it's truly remarkable. And they're also getting involved outside the NCAA so they can actually take prize money and help offset tuition costs. Uh, a lot of the big uh, R1s are getting involved as well as liberal arts universities, uh, but it's something you'll want to keep an eye on. Uh, here's some of the really interesting stats. At the community colleges in the survey, roughly 80% were saying that overall technology experience is good or excellent ahead of the four-year institutions. Um, in last year's survey, too, it looks, it looks like blended learning is still the preferred method, a hybrid approach with material that's online in your learning management systems or on the web, and um, as opposed to face-to-face -to -face or uh, complete
completely uh, online. So and the other, other piece that they asked about is that two-thirds of their students say that instructors are using, uh, fac faculty are using uh, to engage in learning uh, as well as, as enhance learning and engage, engage with students. So that's, that's wonderful. Two-thirds is a good, good progress. And of course, the main device that students are using, as you would expect, are laptops. 94% say that it's critically important to, to their learning uh, objectives. And 89% say that the combination of a smartphone and a laptop is really their key methods. So at the University of San Diego, we, we track this kind of statistics on our Wi-Fi network. And roughly, we were seeing, you know, again, it's a private liberal arts, expensive university. So it's different students that we have than you guys do. But we were seeing about 3.6 devices per student on our network, 3.6. Tablet, phone, watches, laptop, um, smart TVs in the dorm rooms. It's just incredible the number of things that students are bringing to campus today. And uh, you gotta make sure that those are all secure. So this one I threw in um, not for the student success tools, although it's good to see that students are using things like degree audit and planning tools and so on and so forth. It's more for the accessibility question. And this I found to be, again, one of the shining examples of community colleges. We are by no means, I'm not saying that we're doing a great job in addressing accessibility for physical or, or learning disabilities, but, you know, Community colleges are at 63% as opposed to our R1 doctorals at 31. So you should pat yourself on the back. Um, quickly, I'm going to show some examples of active learning spaces and then we'll freeze on into the next part of this presentation, which will be much more interactive and not me talking to you about things. So I just wanted to cherry pick some what I think are really good examples of active learning spaces. Um, one of your student workers, uh, I think his name, Willie? Yeah, he's from Austin, or Round Rock. And I think you went to Austin Community College, right? Yeah, this is uh, one of the really award-winning, stunning spaces that uh, has transformed teaching and learning. Their retention rate is up by 11%. At a community college, that's fantastic. 32,000 square foot space. 604 terminals, and um, it's really paying off. You'll see in this picture, there is a faculty member, she's wearing blue with I think the red scarf. She's teaching a class in this huge open space and circulating around the zones to work one-on-one -on -one with the students. It is super cool. If you ever get a chance to go there, I would strongly recommend that you drop down to Austin and check it out. Um, Oklahoma, we've done, Dell's done a ton of work at Oklahoma. This is a $3 million renovation project. Um, they've completed seven uh, learning spaces, created these uh, really comfortable designs, lots of displays. Faculty um, typically are gonna be operating out of the center of the room, and um, teamwork is set up through these round tables. They've also pushed the concepts out into the dorm rooms as well as other learning spaces, uh, into the library and so forth. You can see the student there writing on the surface of the table. I believe you get as many surfaces as you can to, for students to write on. We were intimately involved with the Hunt Library. I don't know if you know this. This is sort of the premier technology on steroids library in Iowa. If you did ever get a chance to go to NC State, you should check it out. It is stunning. Uh, tons of learning spaces in there, group study spaces. Uh, you know, I was the dean of the university libraries at URI. I always used to tell the administration, our biggest classroom on campus, it isn't this lecture hall, it's the library. And that's where students are doing a lot of learning and active learning with that. So you've got to make the spaces comfortable and desirable. Um, 
This has had a huge impact on retention as well as recruitment in NC State. Sometimes it's uh, one building. Also, I wanted to showcase, this is a very special space at Washington State University. And if you look at that URL or Google it, you can go hear the faculty testimonials. Teaching in the round, it takes a little bit of time and training to learn how to use this space as an instructor. But it's truly incredible. And they have a waiting list for years to get into the space. Um, you can see the projection panels. You can run four different displays. So if you have guest lecturer, you can have a PowerPoint running, maybe something out of the learning management system. All of that happening simultaneously. And um, just a terrific example of an innovative space for teaching and learning. Um, these are my friends at Gensler Architects, who we worked with a lot with at uh, the University of San Diego in converting our learning spaces. This is just kind of a cool, casual uh, seminar flex space where you can get together. There's power outlets everywhere. It's just basically a, a nice big touch screen. And, um, you know, it's not perfect for all sorts of things, but it's more of an informal lecture learning space uh, where teams can get together. So, I also want to recognize Leah again. She's your account rec executive. All things Dell, and um, she can bring the resources and talent to the table. If you have any questions and details about that, Leah's your person. Um, so that's the main thing to get your, your brains running. And let me uh, minimize this. And then we're going to get into some more interactive activities if I can get this other PowerPoint up. And this is just some videos. Okay. We're going to look at survey results too from the student survey at Front Range. All right. Right. Oh, there we go. All right. And I, like I said, I can sell you some equipment. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to have Leo run around the audience and ask, a, uh, ask questions um, at some point. We're going to do some turn and learn so you can uh, have an opportunity to speak with your colleagues. What we want to do is talk, I, I have sort of a set of slides around these topics, but one of them is, uh, first off, on active learning, I want to throw a question out there. What is, what does, because I can, I'm going to throw up my definition, and there's no right or wrong answers, so I'm going to ask you what, I'll throw it out and someone be brave and stand up, what, what is active learning to you? Any takers? Come on. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Be brave. Here, here's a gentleman right up here in the front. I'm gonna, I should have brought prizes. <laughs> I'm not an instructor here. I'm a student. Okay. Uh, active learning to me is hands-on rather than just doing homework in the classroom. Um, the biology department does a great job of that with their uh, flipped classrooms and combined classes. Um, uh, assigning a lot of what would normally be coursework in the classroom as homework, mm -hmm. uh, and both written and video watching, etc., and then actually doing experiments in the classroom, mm -hmm. most classes rather than lectures. Classic uh, flipped classroom model. That's terrific to hear that it's happening here at Front Range. There's a back there, Leah. Active learning is being what really matters. It's the fun, the joy, the engagement. Mm -hmm. It's what gets students really involved mm -hmm. in practicing what you talked about. You learn from them, they learn from you. Mm -hmm. It's where it's at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other takers? Yep, right here, sir. Uh, it's the means by which all of us in this room learned everything that we really know. 
<laughs> All right. What's the, what's, I'll just throw this one out as a follow-up. What's the role of a faculty member in an active learning environment? This young man touched on it a little bit, but what do you see the role of a faculty member in an effective active learning environment? Right here. Yep. Kind of coach, a guide, yep. Consultant, yep. All right, well, I'm going to go to my next slide because that's what, this is what I use with my folks at USD. Um, and again, I have faculty serve as a learning facilitator. Uh, students engage in significant activities inside and outside the classrooms. Also, what I think is really important to know is technology can enhance active learning, but it's not a requirement. I, I view active learning, if there's a team of students sitting over at Starbucks and they're not, they're just sitting there talking about a subject, that is active learning. You know, they're engaging in some team activity or a project or something like that. And then I throw that definition up from my buddy at uh, MIT, Phil Long. He gave this to me back in 2004. Mm -hmm. So I just use it, and it still applies. I think. So, uh, plus he's my friend. Uh, so active learning spaces. Um, here are some things, just useful ideas to keep in mind as you're reimagining your classrooms. And that fourth item on there that says location of learning matters. That doesn't mean learning only occurs in the classroom. The point is, if you take a deeper dive in the article, it can happen anywhere. It can happen outside the classroom, it can happen at home, uh, it can happen in groups, you know, on campus, off campus, and so on. And certainly learning by doing matters. Uh, quickly, I'm going to show you some things that my team in, acad in academic technology services, we had a list of stuff for our faculty to look at and our students to look at. And, this is the list they gravitated to of some features and technologies to consider. By no means is this an exhaustive list, because there's things like you, the university design folks and facilities folks helped with all sorts of things that are not on this list, like blinds, lighting, um, you know, surfaces, textured surfaces to absorb sound correctly, flooring materials, raised flooring, all sorts of things like this. But this is a, a list you guys have probably already thought about this on your committee. Uh, but these are some a lot of the technology items that you should be thinking about for the future in your classrooms if you're not doing so already. And then I have, if I can bail out of this, I'm going to show you a quick two-minute video on Austin Community College so you can see this space a little bit more in action because it is a community college and I really let me escape out of here and see if I can queue up that. Okay, there we go. I'm not going to talk over the video. Okay.
showcase examples, I think, of an innovative space. Um, that photo up there I took just uh, two or three weeks ago when I was visiting. There's an instructor up there doing instruction in uh, this open zone format. And the zones are important, so you can have specific software delivered to the instructor's area in the zone. So if biology wants biology applications delivered to zone three. We do that, or they do it through VDI, virtual desktop interface. It makes you, makes you it, the ability to spin up specific applications in a particular area with systems is incredibly fast. 
They even used it for some administrative offices when an office was taken offline due to a leak in water leak. They moved all those administrators and I think it was enrollment services into zone nine and dedicated those computers to the applications and software that they needed for a two week period. So the speed and power at which IT can deliver services is greatly accelerated. Um, I just wanted to show a quick, couple of quick slides. I took our university through an effort to build a classroom replacement model. We had 189 learning spaces at USG. We're just adding 14 more uh, this year and next. Um, and what we went through, uh, the process of design, implementation, use, and assessment through faculty members and students and then go through another iteration phase to decide on what was important. And what's key is having the right stakeholders involved, and I'm really pleased at the introductory sessions today to hear that you already have a number of stakeholders involved, but this is the, these are the groups we used at the University of San Diego. Uh, certainly, instructors are at top of the list, and students are at top of the list. So I had a faculty advisory committee composed of 18 faculty members, and we had student groups from graduate students, law students, and undergraduates to help in this effort, along with all of the key departments like Academic Technology Services, our Center for Teaching and Learning, Facilities Management, University Design, and so on. The President's Office was even involved, actively involved. Also, don't forget the course schedulers, the people that actually place classes in spaces. They're really important to keep in mind. Um, so we, the proposal I developed with my team included, and you've talked about it, consistency. The technology and the vendor products are consistent across all of our levels of classrooms. We eliminated our basic level classroom one when I took this proposal to our board of trustees. They said, well, why do you even have that start at level two? And literally, in the, in the trustee meeting, they eliminated level one. So that's why I have um, strike throughs on those things. But the, our basic level classroom, basic plus, is what we called it, level two, three, and four. So we settled, settled on three different levels. Roughly 20% of our classrooms are level four. Our entire law school is at level four because they want lecture capture, or what I prefer to call content capture, embedded in every single classroom. And the students use that material that's recorded and study it over and over and over again through the learning management system. Um, Level three is the mainstream classroom at our, at, at our institution. Probably 75% uh, of our classrooms are at the level three standards. So it sounds like you're already thinking about standards and classroom levels, and I think it's important to get that nailed down, but also not be wedded to it, because technology will change, and you're going to want to modify those, so that it's sort of an ongoing, continuous process. And then we finally got the seven-year replacement model approved by our board of trustees, and it was funded outside the normal IT operating budget, thank goodness. And uh, we, we are in that cycle at USD. So now I wanted to move into some questions and looking at the student survey that was conducted that Roxanne mentioned. Um, we're going to talk about some results. And that link please write it down and use it if you can over the next day or so. You don't need to answer everything in this instant, but I'm gonna throw out the question and we're gonna do a little bit of a turn and learn for two minutes on this question. And I'd just like you to chat with your colleagues or whoever's sitting next to you and talk about this question just for a minute. Um, what do you think the students said when they were asked, what do you want learning to look like at FRCC? One minute. And then we'll take some volunteers. <laughs>
participating in that dialogue. So if you're a student, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, let's go ask the students first. Leah. Any, any students willing to share? Give us some input on um, how you answer this? What do you want learning to look like? Before we uh, show you the results. Yeah, thanks. So way over there. I, go, I, was, I saw a green hat, so I'm going here first. <laughs> Hold it real close. Thank you. Yeah, um, so if we're all headed towards virtual reality. Virtual reality, I'm sorry. Um, I feel like that technology should be implemented in our courses. So I don't know, maybe implementing some type of coding class with virtual reality, that way we're all, I don't know, used to coding in that specific language. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Thank you. Other student feedback? I'd like it to be more just like project oriented, talking with uh, other people in your class, not necessarily just sitting there and listening to the teacher's lecture. Because that gets boring and then you can fall asleep in class. <laughs> Thank you. Other comments from students? Uh, for me, I feel like classrooms should be more like hands on. Um, there's been times where like I'll sit in classroom and like uh, the chief instructor will have us just do like a problem, but for me, I feel like being like working as a group and like hearing what other people have to say really helps me as far as like learning mm -hmm. and retaining mm -hmm. that information. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of like lectures and having to like sit there for hours just listening and it's, it's boring, honestly. It's boring and mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's not fun. Thank you. I'm a little biased because founder of Tech Club, so. Um, the smart boards in the classrooms are, when lectures happen on the smart boards and you make annotations while you're presenting content, is really helpful. I, to be completely honest, don't always go back and look at those, but you know how they say when you write something down, you remember it better? Well, when I see someone else write it down, I also remember it better. I am absolutely a VR nut. I have like 200 VR titles and four VR headsets, but I don't know if that's feasible in a classroom environment. I wish it were. Um, but a long time ago, before the Microsoft Surface was a laptop, it was an actual table, one of those interactive tables that heated up there. And if we had those in schools and could do sort of our own version of the smart board in class, working on whatever content we were working on, that would be like my library. Awesome. OK, so here are the results to that question. Um, there were 319 uh, responses to this. So for those of you in the back who cannot see this, this is the largest response, and you heard it directly from this audience. Interactive classrooms that are hands-on was the majority of student responses. 22% of respondents had said that that is what is desired. So this would be in order going kind of backwards here. I'll read it just, I know folks in the back can't see this. So top choice was interactive classroom, hands-on. The second was fun, enjoyable, engaging. And the third, inclusive, accessible. Um, there's obviously plenty of other choices and we can make these results available to this entire audience and those who even aren't here today. Um, but wanted to obviously explain and, and have even students give that perspective because you're hearing most are not interested in the sage on the stage, right? They want an opportunity to talk and to collaborate and work productively amongst their peers to solve problems and, and truly have an opportunity to learn and probably fail and be okay with that kind of environment. And indeed, I think we heard it from some of the responses of the students in here today. I just wanted to ask if you could read the top three. Oh, yeah. For sure. All right. Top three, what they don't want it to look like, right? Better class times delivery options, better class facility, and increased or better communication with faculty and students. <laughs> also, I just want to reiterate that this is a foundational survey done in the spring. I think there's going, as I recall, Roxanne, there's going to be a, another survey, a follow-up survey that dovetails off of this in the fall. Is that correct? 
Okay. Um, let's see what's next. What do you think students said when they were when they were asked what role does technology play in your learning? So we're going to do another turn and learn. But we'd like you to get up and not talk to the same people. So if you feel like giving some exercise, just nap, iterate, move.
I'll use Wi-Fi to get it. I'll use Wi-Fi to submit my stuff. So it's the the thing I need every day. I'll laptop myself on Wi-Fi occasionally. Mm -hmm. Other feedback, even from folks who may not be a student. Uh, I, I teach CCR 92 and 93 in, in the 2021 and uh, over the 2022 over the summer. Uh, I found it surprising that some of my students actually needed um, lessons on how to use their word processors, just Word or, or Google Docs. They really needed to understand how to control uh, headers, footers, how to control, insert page numbers. I mean, you know, that's that's what I would consider basic computer literacy stuff that, that we I need to, needed to stop and teach multiple times so that you get it right. Um, and so I, I, I think just to address that question, I think sometimes the students don't understand what role technology plays. Because your word processor, yeah, your laptop is absolutely a piece of technology, but so is the piece of software. Um, and they really need to be, if they're going to be producing, in my case, if they're going to pr be producing documents over the next two or four years, they need to be a mere expert at document production. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, uh, you know, teaching those basic English classes, I, I, I need to stop and slow down and make sure they understand those classes, but it, that's not really teaching composition or, right. or reading. So, yeah, that's so what I'm hearing is sort of a computer literacy uh, requirement or something like that. Coming. <laughs> not even just for English classes. I teach history, and the amount of time I have to take out of teaching history to teach someone how to format page numbers on, on for their final research paper, because they don't know how to use Word, and that they they come to me and ask me questions about, I don't, under, I don't understand how, you know, not just how did you a footnote, but that they no. can't use the ribbon to actually look for themselves to find where it says, at footnotes. You know, these technical, we're, we also have to be computer, we're expected to be computer experts for all of them, and then I don't use Word, I use Google Docs. How do I work in Google Docs? And all of these things, too. Addressing those two comments, I'd like to point out that Front Range has a class that teaches Word. It's called Several. CIS 118, and it teaches <laughs> Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and it is a requirement for most students here at the oh, campus. But are they taking support? Well, no, maybe, maybe, first is the problem. maybe we need advised. to have that be an early class and work with advising and advise students that they need to take it their first semester here on campus. Maybe they get a prerequisite for your class. Yeah. All right, last one over here, and then we'll look at the survey results after this. Sorry. Can you hear me? So to piggyback on that last comment, we have to embed lessons about these in all of our classes. It's not enough to take CIS 118. It's a foundation. It's the mechanical skill. It doesn't teach you how to use a spreadsheet productively. It doesn't teach you how to create a beautiful doc. No, we have Excel. We have Word. I know that. We have, but we need more than the mechanics. They need to be able to do my subject matter in those tools. They need to be able to do Mary Catherine's subject matter in those tools. It's not enough to just take a class in the tool. We have to make them use the tool in all of our classes. They're not going to learn it otherwise. OK, here are the survey results. I think we're going to have to. Yeah, no Those might be a little easier to read. I don't know. Yeah, so in summation, student survey results definitely acknowledge that technology plays a major role in learning. So that's sort of a two-part question, minor or major role, yep. and then all of those items above that. Uh, right above this describes the role technology plays in learning. Well, they selected, um, it was more a ranking, right, Roxanne, that all folks um, chose in order what was most important, essentially, to the least. So starting with um, how technology is used in learning here to assess learning and complete coursework. Um, the next was course delivered online using technology. And then research, additional information gathering or ebooks. Um, some at the other end, again, um, that just were selected less frequently, would be need more training with technology, preparation for the workplace, 
and communicating with instructor or peers. So perhaps acknowledging there was less use of technology in those methods. These methods for accessing coursework was more prevalent. All right. So from your perspective, what role does technology play in teaching? Notice the shift here and take into account for the voices we just heard, student voices and those acknowledged in the survey here. We want folks to spend a minute talking with the peers around you about what role technology plays in teaching. Keeping in mind the keynote we had earlier, that we're, you know, our Gen Z and Xers are growing up certainly in a very tech-rich world. So what's your reflection as a faculty member and how technology is enhancing your ability to teach. Turn and talk to the folks sitting around you and then we'll do a quick share out here. You can obviously stand up as well. because there's so many different platforms, but it's also the main way that we communicate. Like, I don't go out to the hallways and say, hey, student, you know, like there's always some sort of technological device involved in that communication. 
What, just following up on that, what is, do you have a preferred way to communicate? Because you know, I, I feel that pain too. There's dozens of ways, plenty of software, Slack, email, you name it, internal email systems to learning management systems. Is there any preferred ways that you think students might like to communicate? Well, uh, certainly as a teacher who's been in this world for over 20 years, having technology allows you to access more all at once. But I think technology also, uh, it complicates things tremendously. It's a lot of time. And it's more about commodifying and, uh, and applying, uh, 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 supplying data for not what I'm so much interested in in my classroom. Teach writing, so uh, the pieces and parts of how that plays out, the statistics of how many are passing or how many fail halfway through the semester. Uh, are, uh, my concern is with the individual in the classroom. So I'm, I'm a data provider in, in this role with technology. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah, so for me, I teach business statistics, uh, and I use the McGraw uh, Connect Access environment. It allows me to offload a lot of the grunt work associated with grading and stuff. I can set up with quizzes, and all the quizzes are automatically graded. Reading assignments are done automatically, and it also allows me the ultimate in terms of flexible scheduling. So one of the when we talk about inclusive access around here, one of the things I find is that allowing students flexibility in terms of completing assignments with regard to due dates, uh, I'm changing those pretty much constantly. What, what, what was that, McGraw? McGraw Hill Connect Access. Connect Access, okay. Interesting. Any final else? comment? Oh. Uh, I've gone paperless. I don't accept any written, yeah. any paper. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and they must be submitted to the appropriate assignment folder. I don't even accept them through email. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the greening of campus. He's the hero to many in this room. Okay, and then uh, let's see. We got another slide here. Leah? Yeah. So which, is, yeah which of the following would you help you be more successful in the classroom? Yeah, so this one was a different question asked to students, and just to highlight some of the um, things that were most prevalent in terms of student perspective, their responses here. Um, the, the most frequent response was a printer. Printer <laughs> access via... So the counterpoint to which was just made. Which is very interesting, but via their personal device. So students being able to have access to that piece of technology and being able to print through their own um, connected device. The second uh, most prevalent selective response was better Wi-Fi, better or upgraded Wi-Fi. And the third is a student accessible printer. So the first was via yeah. their personal advice, device, and the third was... Um, that, that one really shocked me when I saw these results of why students would want a printer, but maybe it's because they don't have printers accessible to them at home. Is that possible? Yes. Okay. Right. And the, I wanted to point out the fourth was a charging station, so having access to uh, being able to charge the device. So on the printer issue, we do, we do peer editing. You can't peer edit someone's paper with three people on their personal laptop. You've got to bring in three copies that you can distribute to other students so that you can have good editing. And the number of my students who come unprepared because they just print out for some reason, whatever the reason is, so that is the same If it's zero for day, they'll stop. I'm sorry. Excuse, excuse them. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, there's, there's that too. But I mean, Sorry. yeah, if they had quick access to a printer, that would be great. Is there is there an application or software that could be used to demonstrate the peer editing within, um, say, Google Docs or even within Word? Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, next question that was asked to the students, which of the following on-campus technologies 
would help you be more successful? So in number one, enhanced Wi-Fi, showing up, printer being number two, and the charging stations come in at three. So I have a question about Wi-Fi, and maybe the students can answer this. Do you have Wi-Fi across the entire campus? the library has good Wi-Fi coverage. Yeah, and one of the challenges universities and colleges face is the constant cycle of Wi-Fi upgrades. So 802.11ax is the current standard, and it's expensive, right? To switch out an access point is a thousand bucks a pop, typically. And if you want to do an overlay on campus, you know, I don't know how many access points you guys have, but we had 2,200 access points because we had dormitories you know residence halls so it's expensive to do but you've got to keep up on it it's, it's almost a necessity it is the lifeblood of how students connect and get access to information not just academics but all sorts of things um, any surprises with this okay from the perspective of a faculty member if you had no limitations, what would you ask for in your classrooms? The unbounded budget question. <laughs> we throw it out there because this was a question asked of the students. So we're going to spend a couple minutes. Chai with your colleagues. We'll give you a minute to talk with your peers. wired to the floor and so that they can uh, with, and, and collaborative computing so that they can they can see each other's work on their computers so they don't have to print papers they can they can see the other paper from their teammate on their computer and as an as a instruct, instructor I'd like to see what every student is doing on their computer from mine so that I don't have to make laps up and down each aisle in my classroom to see what everybody's doing that's how we stay fit. That's how we stay fit, right? I'm not the only one who saw this. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Does this really work? Better? Better? Oh, okay. I want an RV, a really big one. Like I said, I'm not alone. Um, April had the same idea. Um, hers was the bus, which sounds much more creative. But to go to real places, 
with real students, with their real bodies. That's what I want. <laughs> mobile, mobile, mobile classroom. Awesome. Mobile classroom. Over here. Over here. I want it fully enabled for distance learning. Full duplex, audio, video, everything. So there's a classroom at Westminster, a classroom in Boulder County, a classroom at Larimer, and a student at home on WebEx. They're all participating. Nothing big. <laughs> Other ideas? Yeah, it, it seems like we've got uh, most of the technology that we have right now, which is great, uh, places a lot of the interactivity, the active learning process, is still in the hands of the instructor. Mm -hmm. And it's an important step forward, but it's, I'm, I'm asking what's involved in making, uh, I've heard it mentioned the, uh, the, the tables being touch screens, virtual reality headsets on, on the students. I have no idea how you generate virtual reality content or D2L or whatever <laughs> platform you're using, but it seems like that's the next logical step. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? One more? Let's see. So again, speaking from the district perspective, I would love to be able to take my students on virtual reality field trips to the Battle of Marathon. I mean, is that technology out there and how do we get all of that? Yeah, he, the content is still an issue, but the companies that are uh, absolutely building it out for certain, dis it's usually discipline specific. I mentioned that stuff at UCLA Medical with Blousen. It's purely medicine based. Um, there is a uh, there's a company out of oh man, I think it's in Arkansas, but they work with the University of Arkansas and they're focused on uh, archaeology, uh, geography, and certain disciplines. I can get the name of it, but it is very much content based. There's a company called Labster out of um, Switzerland. It is focusing purely on physics, biology, and chemistry, and their content is just fantastic. But again, we're still in the infancy of this, and I don't want to suggest that VR is like the thing to do today. It is still in, you know, it's, it's got to mature, and as many of you have already uh, cited, content is key, and if it's not available, then you can't do anything with it. But uh, we'll get the names of those companies for you. I'll pass those to uh, Roxanne and uh, Melinda. Yeah. Sir? Well, it said no limitations. And John triggered something when he said the, the classroom in the round and you have multiple screens. Yeah. So I've embraced the Barb Patterson notion that the person who does the work does the learning. And so most of my classes that we've divided them up in between three to six groups. And it'd be nice that if each group had their own screen and each screen was independently controlled and I could put the problem for that group, each group gets a different problem. Yep. And put the problem or theme for that group up there and then they could work from that. And so, I mean, that's just a wish list. Yeah. Fantastic. You guys, there's a ton of great ideas in this room, and yeah. as we wrap this up, um, I want to make sure, we'll go back one, Chris, sorry. I want to make sure everybody writes this down, because this is going straight to your faculty, as Roxanne kicked this off today. I mean, this is a really important time for your community to be leveraging your voice to explain what it is that you need to enhance teaching and learning here. Students, as I mentioned, um, there was a survey. There will be another survey in the fall. Um, it'd be really easy for your institution just to go and buy technology from a manufacturer like Dell, or anybody else for that matter. And I've got to commend your community for not being in a hurry to do that. And to think systemically about what the impact technology has on teaching and learning in this community. It's really important that you take the time and not just hurry up and buy something for the sake of buy something, but figure out what the future holds for your students, knowing what kind of world they're immersed in, as Chris described in his keynote. Technology is here, it's prevalent, it's around us, but as we all know, 
It's not the end all be all to learn. It's a tool, as most of you described today. And so this is an opportunity for you to give your input back to the group that is spearheading a lot of this work. And again, kudos to the folks who are leading this initiative and really thinking holistically what this entails. Because it's not just about buying the shiny objects and sticking those shiny objects in the hands of educators um, or students without thinking through truly what yeah. is doing, required. Doing it in a thoughtful way. And we're going to assemble all of the input that comes in here and send it back to front range administrators that we're working with. This will be an opportunity to have some say in the process, for sure. Um, and then I think we're just about done with this. Is that the last one? Yeah, and if this was the student perspective of if they had no limitations, what would they ask for in a classroom? Yeah. So number one choice was improved access to hardware. The second choice um, was uh, other facility room changes not necessarily explicitly defined there, but some, some physical room changes. And then uh, the third was access to support services, activities, or food. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Right? Um, so those at the other end, um, different library hours, that was not a highly selected choice. Reducing technology, not, a select, not as high of a selected choice and then better access to textbooks or e-books on the other end of that. So, And this is the closing slide. I really want to commend you all, um, the, and also to participate in this dialogue. I think you're off to a great start in the front range. Um, just, you know, the thing I found in my experiences at USD is don't exclude groups that are critical to this. You know, make sure you have all the right stakeholders involved. It's pretty obvious in the planning and design phase. Do it in a contemplative way. Don't rush, as Leah said. You know, any vendor can start selling you technology. You need to do it in a very thoughtful and, and planned and contemplative manner. Um, surveying is great, but also get groups together, diverse groups together to work on this. It's super important. Um, also, yes, Melinda? with your representatives from each of your campus and we will send that out and I highly recommend that you work directly with your representatives at your particular campus to make sure that your your voice is heard over the next four or five months we're going to be doing a lot of this but they are your voice in that team and so if you're not sure who that is see Roxanne or see me and we can help you put you in touch with your campus representatives I see several of them here um, but that way we're getting it all pulled together and you know exactly who to go to so you're, you you get your input set. Awesome. And so, you know, another thing I would do is leverage the great work that's already occurring. I, I studied the works, the website um, for the FRCC Active Learning Institute. And it absolutely looks like a group that is helping to set the stage and help faculty members be successful with active learning and changing, changing their pedagogy and the curriculum. Also, I would just strongly advise having multiple tech levels in your classrooms. One size fits all is usually not a good fit. And, um, you know, just Dell Technologies is here. We, we want to work with you. We want to make sure that you're successful. And Leah, again, is your primary contact and I'm sure she'll be back to visit with you. Um, and that pretty much closes it. Thank you all so much for participating.
sort of the, the sneak peek on this and do continue to provide your input on this because I think it'll be a really important partnership. So we'll get all that information out there to you. Um, take a, you might take a few minutes now to look through um, your program, look at all of the, the different options that are out there. Lots of things throughout the day on everything from inclusivity, um, there's a session uh, the group I mentioned earlier where there's an active learning session this afternoon about that role playing project that was highlighted by Elk. So look for you know, lots of different things in there. And also remember to um, share your ideas and thoughts for future things you'd like to see next year via this all leaves. Um, tomorrow we will also have an interactive all conference session here at 10. It's focused on teaching excellence. There's a group of faculty and instructors at the college who's been working with me. It's been kind of an informal, organic process this year. Um, for anyone who's involved in the Teaching Excellence group, could you stand up? Folks who are here today, and then I think some more are going to be here tomorrow. But we will be sharing um, and having an opportunity for you to share and, and give your input on what are some of the hallmarks of Teaching Excellence at Front Range. And what are those key themes that make us who we are and that we believe are critical to effective learning? And then, um, because what this group is exploring is one, how do we articulate that? How do we pull together all the threads? Because all these different projects that we do, they're focused on student success. And so how do we pull these different pieces together in a way that's meaningful so that we can then better support everyone? Because again, the idea is lots of great things happening all over the college. How can we organize ourselves so that we can amplify those and really support everyone who teaches here and serves students so we can then serve the students better. So um, look forward to that tomorrow. You'll have a chance to meet some of the other members of the team and hear about those. And then Kay Novak, who you know is our um, technology, one of our technology gurus here. Um, and one of the things she, yes, really loves is um, one Minute Media. Have any of you had a chance to learn about that through the online instructor certification or anything? She's going to introduce us all to that concept and why just a quick informal One Minute Media can be so helpful, both as a, a communication tool for instructors. Um, I saw a really cool thing at a, at a conference. Online Learning Consortium happened to be in Denver this year, so I was fortunate to be able to go over there and saw some instructors in their, they were presenting on their own professional development. And they shared what they call video postcards that were just one, one or minute or less. Quick descriptions, like they'd be at the gas station or maybe they were on a trip to a food market or you know, depending on whatever their class was, they just took a little selfie of themselves and said, hey, you know, hi, I'm instructor and I'm here at the food market, you know, say it's a nutrition class and these are the things that I'm seeing here and how I can pick them out and, you know, I just wanted to share that with you, you know, catch up with you soon. Just some of those little quick video clips, they, they aren't necessarily delivering a ton of content, but they're tying the content to the teacher, to the student, and creating that relationship. It really was energizing. So that would be one way you can use these one minute media pieces. I think Kay will also share the structure that you can use so that students, as part of an active learning activity, can create those kinds of one minute media in their class. You know, that part about the, one of the best ways to learn is to teach, sort of creating as a group those messages um, using technology. So look forward to that. We'll use that to also collect then your input, both about what teaching excellence is here and your ideas, both examples of projects that you might want to share with others um, so that we can then archive those and have those as a resource for all of us. Or I um, send you guys all out for lunch, which will be in the rotunda. Any, any questions about this morning or about the conference or things that are coming up? Just a quick reminder to be sure to bring your bring your name tags and scan those. Um, we do archive those, and even if you um, are staff and are not getting paid, it's still really important to scan your name tags so that we know who came. Um, it really helps us to tell which session we want to continue on for the All right.
Well, with that, um, why don't you go ahead and, and go out? I think they're just finishing setting up lunch, but this would be a good time to stretch, take a little walk around, um, and come back to the lunch and session. Is